Well, thanks again for joining us this evening. Uh, the, tonight we'll be going over the second part of Know the Vote, and we'll talk specifically about the judicial branch. And today's presenter will be Jessica Foreman, and she is our Director of Advocacy at the League of Women Voters Austin area. All right, thank you so much, Jen, and thank you to everybody joining us tonight here in the Zoom presentation and also on our Facebook Live. Um, we're excited that you are ready because starting next week, early voting for the primary this year is coming up and we know you're thinking about who you should be voting on. So we're glad you're joining us tonight. And before we get started, many thanks to uh, my moderator tonight, Jen Delk, who also prepared a lot of this presentation. If you're familiar at all with the League Civic Education, then you are familiar with Jen's work as she is one of the main drivers of our Civic Civi series and always does a great job at helping you get into the weeds to know what you need to before you get to the ballot box. Um, tonight, if you have a question at any time, uh, if you're here in the program with us, you can put it in the chat or the questions box. I have those open. I'll be looking that up in periodically. Uh, you can also leave a question on the Facebook Live and Jen will be following along there and I uh, can read those out uh, when we get to a stopping point. No promises that I'll know the answer, but if I do, then we'll certainly uh, look into it and get into the weeds on the judicial races. So first, a little bit about who we are. Uh, the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization, and uh, that's why tonight we won't be telling you who to vote for, okay? We're not recommending any candidates. Instead, we're just telling you what particular offices are going to be on the ballot and what are some things you should be thinking about when you go in to vote for those races. Um, we do a lot of services that we hope you are familiar with and a big one that's happening right now is our voters guide. And so as we go through this presentation, if you, after the program, go to our website at lwbaustin.org, you can download the voter's guide and you can actually see candidate responses to questions based on particular races. So it really helps you get to know all of the candidates before you decide who you'd like to vote for. Well, as I said, the primary is coming up quick. The first day to vote early is Monday, Valentine's Day, February 14th. Uh, and the last day to vote early in person, not too long after that on the 25th, and election day is going to be March 1st. Um, Jen and I were just talking before we got started how quickly elections always come upon us, so we're glad you're here tonight to get ready for this next one. What kind of election is this? This is a primary election, okay? Primaries are a way to narrow down the number of candidates running for a specific office. We have partisan offices here. What that means is that uh, we have different parties running, right? And so the partisan offices that are up for re-election in November, you could vote in the Democratic primary this time or the Republican primary or a uh, Libertarian, and they will come up and be voted on in the general election. So March 1st, each party is gonna choose its candidate based on who you vote for. We have open primaries in Texas. And what that means is you don't have to register with a party. There are some other states in the United States where you have to be a registered Republican or a registered Democrat to vote in the primary, but that's not the case here. You can select a party uh, right when you go in. You just can't vote twice, right? So you can only choose one, uh, but it doesn't matter which one you want to choose. It could be because you feel strongly about a certain party, or maybe the races in your area are only competitive in the primary. So you want to make sure to get your voice heard. Whatever it is, you don't have to be registered, and you can just go and show up to vote for who you'd like. There are a lot of folks on the ballot in this primary election. Uh, this is just a list of all of them. Many of them uh, you went over last week in the first part of this series with Jen, uh, especially uh, elections that fall under the executive and legislative branch. And this time we're gonna be talking about the judges, which oftentimes sneaks up on people. They forget that there's a whole lot of judicial races sometimes at the top and the bottom of the ballot. 
just as a reminder too, we have new voting districts, okay? So you may be in a different location. You may be voting on different groups of folks than you were in the past. Every 10 years, as you're probably familiar, data from the census is used to redraw the political districts. And they determine where you vote and who represents you at all levels of government, including which judicial races you may be voting on. So be sure and check if you're still in the same district. Okay, so as we get into talking about judicial races, what do we mean by judicial races? Well, you might be more familiar with how the federal government is set up. We have three branches of government, the legislative, that's like the Senate and the House of Representatives. We have the executive branch, which is the president, the VP and their cabinet. And then we have the third branch, which is the judicial, which is the Supreme Court, the one that we most likely hear about, but also all of the federal court system. Well, Texas is actually set up in a very similar way. We also have three branches of government in Texas. The executive branch is the governor, lieutenant governor, and a whole lot of folks who manage agencies at the state level. The legislative branch, the Texas House and the Texas Senate. And then the judicial branch, which is uh, the two court systems at the top of the state of Texas, the Supreme Court and the Court of Criminal Appeals. And then as we go down, we also have county level judicial offices, which we'll be talking about here at the end too. I think the number one question people have when they're deciding on who to vote for in a judicial race is what exactly are you supposed to look for? You know, a lot of times when you're voting for a senator or a representative, you want to know well, what kind of policies do they want to enact and do I agree or disagree with those? But with judges, they're not enacting legislation. So it can be difficult to decide what you should really be looking for in a judicial candidate. And so we have some principles here from the American Bar Association that they suggest you consider in choosing judges. So let's go through some of those before we get into the weeds on what specific uh, judges are up for election. You want someone who will uphold the rule of law. That seems really obvious, right? But it's very important. Um, judges are not supposed to make legislation from the bench. They're supposed to review the law. Uh, sometimes you might hear judges campaign on issues they have no control over. Like an example is you might hear a, a lower court judge say, I'm going to do away with abortion. Uh, but actually, they don't have any cases that have anything to do with abortion in their courts. So this is something you can kind of keep an eye on when folks are running for judicial races. Are they really talking about things they have control over? Are they talking about the rule of law that they'll actually see in the courts they want you to vote for them for? The second thing is you want them to be independent and impartial. Okay? You don't want them to come in and already have pre-decided what type of person they want to win a case. And this can be really important because judges are elected by partisan elections, meaning they run as a Democrat or Republican or Libertarian or Green Party, uh, and they also can get donations from groups. So they may be getting a donation from a group of people that they know are going to come into the court. So because that's how the system is set up, we want to be extra sure that the folks that we are voting on can somehow rise above this conflicted system and still be very independent and impartial when they roll on cases. You want someone with good temperament and character. Uh, you really want people to feel like justice is being performed in a court. And so to do that, the judge needs to have the kind of like ethical behavior that you would expect. And let me give you an example of, uh, of this that I've heard of in the past. There was a judge, it wasn't in Texas, I think it might've been in Florida, who said, if a cell phone goes off in my court, I'm gonna hold you in contempt and charge you $25 if that happens. Very serious about not having cell phones go off. Uh, during the court case, his cell phone went off, okay? And what did he do? He charged himself $25. He held himself in contempt and paid it. And that's just a really small example, but I think that's a good example of if you're, you know, your character, you think this is important, you're holding yourself to the same standards. Um, you want someone, uh, you know, the judge to have the confidence of the public. 
You don't want someone who's too political because then it's going to look like they're slated for one side or the other before the case even begins. Um, judges who are on the bench are actually not supposed to endorse other candidates for office, even the president for this reason. Now, if you're not on the bench and you're just running for judge, that's not necessarily a rule for you. Um, but that's important because you want whoever's coming to court to feel very confident in your impartiality. The next one, you want uh, the judicial system to be diverse and reflective of the community it serves, okay? Uh, this has been a hot topic of conversation. As you know, there is a Supreme Court justice uh, slot that's up for President Biden to select someone, and he said he's really looking for a Black woman for that uh, because he wants to reflect the diversity of America, right? And so that could be something you want to consider when you're voting as well. And judges should also perform their duties in a manner that assures public faith and confidence. So that just kind of sums up everything else, that they look really impartial, that they look very ethical, that they know what they're doing, they look very competent. So that was a lot of things, right? Uh, so to kind of put that down into some smaller boxes that might be helpful, um, three things. Does this judge have relevant experience? Uh, for example, they may be an attorney, but have they had experience of the type of cases that are going to come to this particular court? Uh, you know, do they have uh, experience on both sides, you know, with, say, in a criminal court with victims, but also with defendants? You know, what kind of experience do they have that will help them be good? Uh, demeanor and ethics, do they have a really strong character? Are they getting out there slinging in the mud during the primary? It's not, that's something we grow very used to in politics, but you don't really want to see that as much, right, in your judicial branch. And do they have management skills? Courts are like big offices. They have a t huge databases and software systems, a lot of staff. You know, do they have somebody that can kind of handle managing those things? And there's some hot topics that kind of come up over and over again with all levels of the court that everybody's kind of talking about. Um, with many types of, not all the courts, but with some of them, you have folks called self-represented lit litigants. This is somebody who goes to court without an attorney, okay? So maybe you have a, a small lawsuit or maybe you have a divorce or something and you don't want to hire an attorney. Um, that's very common. And so, can the court handle working with folks who are self-represented? Does it have good resources and a good way to explain to just a regular person how the court functions? Technology. During COVID, especially initially, a lot of the courts couldn't hold court. Uh, did all business just stop? Were they able to transition online? What kind of tech skills do the folks running have that could help them run a very modern court? A campaign finance, again, judges can get donations. And so this is one that really comes up a lot, especially in the top courts that we'll talk about a little bit later. And political pressure. Uh, like everything, you're going to see that the temperature has kind of ramped up, right? So can a judge remain impartial and kind of handle situations where there's really high stress and political pressure? Okay, so that's like the big picture. Let's actually look at the court system and talk about who you're actually going to be voting for. So here's a little graphic that kind of shows you the court system. It is kind of a unique court system and it can be a little complex, but we're gonna go through it. So most state courts in the United States, they have one top court, but Texas and only I think one or two other states have what's called a bicameral court system, which means we have two co-equal top courts, the Supreme Court, which handles civil issues and the Court of Criminal Appeals, which handles criminal issues. And then we have the Court of Appeals, Everything you see here in green below that, those are called trial courts. But that's kind of what we think of when we think of court, where there may be a jury and there's a judge sitting there and a case starts. It could be a traffic ticket. It could be a divorce. It could be a lawsuit, okay? So green all has different kinds of cases that can start there. The Court of Appeals and the Court of Criminal Appeals and Supreme Court, they only hear cases that have been appealed, okay? And we'll go into a little more detail there. But appellate courts, these top three, don't try cases. They don't have juries. They don't hear witnesses. 
Rather, they simply review the actions and decisions of the lower courts on questions of law or maybe if there was a procedural error. Uh, the appellate courts are usually restricted to the evidence and exhibits presented in the green courts and the trial courts. Let's start with one that you might be more familiar with than the other one, which is the Texas Supreme Court, one of our top two courts. Uh, they have statewide jurisdiction over everywhere in Texas, and civil cases are what they hear. These are usually between people or institutions like a business, typically over money. Um, so they can include cases involving fraud, property rights, personal injury, but also environmental cases or cases on types of election law or abortion, all kinds of things, a really wide view. Um, in order to be a Supreme Court justice, you have to be a citizen, hold state re residency, you be, have to be an attorney, older than 35 and younger than 74. Although you have to run when you're younger than 74, if you age above that one, you're on the court, that's okay. And you have to practice law or been a judge for at least 10 years. So those are some requirements to get through the gate. So when you see um, some competitive races in the primary for the Texas Supreme Court, what should you kind of be looking for? Okay, so they're going to be thinking, is a law constitutional according to the Texas and U.S. constitutions? Some of the hot topics that come are coming right now in front of the Texas Supreme Court is the new abortion law on suing someone who's had, um, not who had the abortion, but someone who helped them get the abortion, okay? So you saw part of that go straight to the Supreme Court in a, in a federal case, but there's also a state case going in front of the Texas Supreme Court soon. Um, certain types of cases regarding election law, not criminal cases, but cases like um, when a when um, people are arguing over who won an election, right? That goes to the Supreme Court. And uh, campaign finance and environmental issues will all go to the Supreme Court. So sometimes I think the Supreme Court is a little easier to vote on because these are issues that you think a lot when you're voting on a legislator, right? And uh, now judges shouldn't act the same way as legislators, but you can kind of see the history of how they ruled on certain kinds of cases based on, say, their campaign website or the information they're putting out. So based on your opinion, you may be looking for a particular type of judge to sit on this court, and that can help you make a decision there. Uh, I have a question here. Is there some way to find out how many complaints have been filed against a judge via the State Commission on Judicial Conduct? It's a good question. I don't know if there's a way to see if there's actually a tally on particular judges, but it is pretty easy to go to the State Commission on Judicial Conduct's website and search for a judge by name, or to see the most recent public, um, public things that have come out. Now, sometimes there's private sanctions where they don't release the name of the judge, so you can't tell there. Um, but a public sanction, if it had come out, say if I was a judge, you could go search Jessica Foreman and see if any of those public sanctions had come out. And I will, at the end, pop that website in there in case anybody's interested. Good question. So that's one of the top courts. Oh, and actually, Jen put that website right in the chat as we're talking, if you'd like to look at that. So that's one of the top courts. And the other co-equal top court is the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. Uh, this is the criminal court. It also has statewide jurisdiction. It has the same job requirements as Supreme Court, which is citizen res residency attorney between 35 and 74 and practice law or been a judge for 10 years. And they're going to be responsible for um, some unique things. The thing we most likely hear about with the Court of Criminal Appeals are death penalty appeals. Um, you know, if we had that little chart that we looked at earlier, let me go back and see. And you see the little arrows, those are kind of showing you how things are appealed. And you see that normally they're appealed to the next level, right? So justice of the peace is appealed to a county court and then to a court of appeals and then up to the top courts. But there's a little arrow from the criminal district court straight up to the court of criminal appeals. And that's because death penalty appeals sometimes need to move very quickly and they bypass and go straight up to the court of criminal appeals. 
So often when the CCA, as it's sometimes known as in the news, it's because of death penalty cases, but they also hear all kinds of appeals on different criminal things. Say something went wrong in a speeding ticket case, that's still criminal. It could go up to the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals as well. They also can rule on if a criminal law is constitutional according to the Texas of the U.S. Constitutions. So some hot topics you might be thinking about when you're voting on this is innocence claims. And this could be like, say someone has, say DNA evidence has exonerated someone that's been in prison. Um, and then they, they maybe think like, or they're judging that evidence to see if it can go back to trial or if that person just flat out is innocent, that often goes up to the court of criminal appeals, death penalty. And then an interesting one that has popped up just recently is who can prosecute criminal election law? This has kind of been something that has been in the news where recently the court of criminal appeals uh, was reviewing in certain cases when the Texas attorney general can prosecute these versus when a district attorney or a county attorney can. Um, so some election law that's not criminal in nature could be appealed up to the Supreme Court, but the criminal aspects of it would go to the Court of Criminal Appeals. So depending on your view of criminal justice reform or the death penalty or criminal acts with election law, uh, that can help you decide what kind of judge you'd like to elect for the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. So here's another chart to kind of show us where we are. We've got those yellow arrows at the top, um, which we just covered, the Supreme Court and the Court of Criminal Appeals. And now we're going down to that next level, which is the Texas Court of Appeals. This is the Intermediate Appellate Court. And there are 14 of these with over 80 justices and they have a regional jurisdiction, okay? And they, hear cases that are being appealed, and then they can go, if they're still being appealed, they'll go up to the Supreme Court if it's civil or the Court of Criminal Appeals if it's criminal. One thing is the appellate courts hear both criminal and civil cases. So you really want to look for a judge in this case that's familiar with all types of law, right? Because they're not just going to get, they could get, you know, um, they could get something that's gone wrong in a criminal case as well as an environmental law, all kinds of stuff. So they need to have a really broad depth, broad, broad and deep knowledge base. Uh, some of the hot topics that have come out of this, and also they have the same requirements as the top courts for the age and the residency and being an attorney and practicing for 10 years. So some of the hot topics is how the appeals court is structured. That so I kind of want to put that here because the judge actually isn't necessarily running on that because they don't make that decision. The legislator or um, the House of Representatives and Senate and Governor and all that would pass that legislation. Um, but that is one of the questions regarding we asked in the voters guide on um, how they feel about this restructuring. So right now um, there are 14 courts and there is a bill to make to reduce the number of courts. I think it's to seven. Yeah, into seven. So basically reducing them by half. And it's really invited some controversy with one side saying, yes, this is good. This is really going to streamline the courts and help make it more effective. And the other side saying, you're just doing this as kind of a way to gerrymander uh, a certain political party to be able to win. And it's actually going to overwhelm the courts with cases. And so if you're curious to see what the candidates for this office think about the restructuring, you can go into the voter's guide and see their answers. And uh, there was a broad range of answers, and I found it really interesting to read those myself. So you might look in there. And really, you're going to see kind of the same hot topics as the Supreme Court and the Court of Criminal Appeals, like, uh, especially on matters like abortion and things like that, where these cases do move for the appeals court, too. So again, depending on your, your opinion on how you want judges to review those types of issues, that might help you decide who to vote for when you're voting for your appeals court judges. Okay, so we're done with the top three, the appellate courts. Now we're moving into the trial courts. And the highest level of trial courts that you'll be voting on in both Williamson County and Travis County are district judges. And there's two types of district courts. Uh, one is civil district court, and civil can include family law. That's 
like child custody and divorce. It can also include personal injury. That's like suing someone, say you get in a car accident, contracts, contested elections, all kinds of things go to the civil court. A uh, criminal court is felony criminal matters. So there's different types of laws. And when you break them, there's different penalties. There's the misdemeanors, which are the lower level, uh, and then the felonies. So, you know, felonies can range anywhere from like murder to maybe having multiple um, driving under the influence of alcohol um, to all kinds of stuff. But those felony cases are always going to go up to the district court. So you want to be looking for folks that have experience, right? If they're running for a civil district court, then maybe you want to see some civil background experience. Not necessarily, but that's a, a good thing to look at and see what folks want. And again, uh, especially when you're dealing with family law, you really want someone who has a good demeanor and can kind of handle these really heated situations. Um, when you're voting on a criminal district court judge, depending on your opinion on where criminal justice should go and sentencing, you might look at the type of folks that are running for that position, and that can help frame who you like there. Okay, now we've done the top and we're moving down um, to the county level courts. And county level courts can be a little complicated because not everything in here will be voting on. Some judges are appointed. Uh, so we're only going to talk about the judges that you're going to be voting on in the primary election. So one you might be voting on is the county judge. But wait a second, because this one is a little different. In the large counties like Travis and Williamson, the county judge actually doesn't hear like isn't doesn't have the duties of a normal judge okay they don't hear misdemeanor cases they don't hear lawsuits instead they kind of function like the head of the legislative or executive branch of the county they head up the commissioner's court who can pass the county laws and who set the county budgets and they also are the head of like emergency management and things like that so i have the big weight there because even though it hasn't a judge in the title it's really functioning quite differently. You might think of it more as like the mayor of the city or the governor of the state and the county judge of the county, okay? So um, you want to look at when you're voting for these folks that have your legislative pri uh, priorities in line. So if you are looking for a certain type of road to be built, uh, big issues in both of our counties, or you want to know what the budget is for, for elections or things like that, then your legislative priorities would be more helpful in voting for county judge. So even though they're technically in the judicial branch, they function quite a bit differently, at least in large counties like Travis and Williamson. In smaller counties out in Texas, they actually have dual roles where they hear regular court cases as well as work as the executive and function in passing laws for the county too. Okay, so there's another type in counties where our county judge is busy doing things like legislating and running emergency management. We have county courts at law and they take over some of those other duties, which is they hear misdemeanor cases. So again, the law, the top, um, the criminal acts that get you the higher sentencings or felonies and below that are misdemeanors. And county courts at law are going to hear different kinds of misdemeanors. Interestingly, too, uh, in Travis and Williamson, different county courts at law have different focuses. And this can help you decide who to vote for, because you might be looking for somebody that has ideas for this particular type of court or who has experience in this area. So, for example, um, the county court at law number four in Travis County is a domestic violence court. So they try to funnel all the domestic violence misdemeanors to that court. And the idea behind having these specialty courts is so that there are a lot of resources bundled for this particular group. And um, that a lot of the folks interacting everywhere from, you know, the prosecutors, the defense, the judge, to the bailiff had a lot of experience with these types of cases. So um, you might be looking for somebody that has experience with domestic violence or has some ideas to help that. Um, the number six court in Travis County 
uh, is responsible for Project Engage. And what that is, is a program that helps youth impacted by the justice system. So number six is going to have a lot of juveniles in there. So you might be looking for somebody that has a background or ideas for that type of population. In Williamson County, the number two county court at law has the Veterans Treatment Court and the Misdemeanor DWI Drug Court. Um, so you might be looking for somebody that has some ideas about how to divert folks to these specialty courts to kind of give them resources that can help their particular issues. And if you look in the voters guide, you'll see that all the folks running for these courts, they talked specifically about why they thought they would be great to work with domestic violence, to be the judge for the treatment court and things like that. So it's really helpful to kind of review their background on that to help you make your choice. Okay, so now we're moving down to the courts of limited jurisdiction. You'll see that there are two boxes at the bottom, um, justices of the peace and municipal courts. We're not gonna cover municipal courts because in our area, those are actually appointed by city council. So um, you won't be voting on them, but justices of the peace are elected offices. So we'll talk about them next. Justices of the peace are my favorite because I work with them in my day job. So I really enjoy uh, hearing about this court. And it's a really fascinating court because it has a whole lot of interesting things involved in it. So justice of the peace hear civil cases, including evictions. All the evictions go to JP court. They hear lawsuits for cases $20,000 or less. So over that, it will go to the higher court. But below that, it comes to the JP. They hear class C misdemeanors. Those can be everything from mostly traffic tickets. If you've ever got a speeding ticket, you might end up in JP court. But even things like certain hunting misdemeanors or boating misdemeanors, all kinds of interesting things. In some areas, some of the courts actually magistrate at the jail. That means they set bail and bond for the folks who have been arrested. And in some areas, not in Travis, but in Williamson County, they have coroner's duties, which means they do inquests when someone dies and determine cause and manner of death. What a grab bag of different things for a judge to do, right? And they also have some interesting uh, differences in that you do not have to be an attorney to be a justice of the peace. Uh, you have to be 18 and have resided in your precinct for six months. So uh, lots of different different things for this office going on here. So what are some of the hot topics with Justice of the Peace? Uh, well, evictions uh, during COVID and how the court handles evictions and gets information because there's been a lot of law changes with evictions. So how successful are they in getting that information out to litigants? Uh, most people who go to Justice Court actually don't have an attorney. So you're really looking for a judge that can explain sometimes complicated law to folks like me or you who may not have a legal background. And technology, uh, you know, like all the courts using Zoom and different things, uh, you know, what kind of person can really run the court up to the modern level with things like that. Uh, so that's JPs, and they're up for election both by precinct. So your county precinct, and those did change in the census. So you want to be sure and look at those and make sure you didn't get put into a different precinct and you might be voting on a different judge for that part. All right, are there any questions about on the Facebook um, about specific courts, Jen, or are we good to go on? Yep, we're good to move on right now. Okay, good. Okay, so that's kind of a very generic overview of a complex system that is not all the judges in the state. There are lots of other judges who are appointed uh, for different things that we won't go over, um, but that is a general overview. So now that you have an idea of what each kind of judge does, the question is, okay, we really want to get down here and see who's running and what are they saying and who's recommending them and, and, and who should I choose, okay? So definitely start by going to the voter's guide because you can hear all the folks running for these offices in their own voice. What do they think the priority of this position is? What are their feelings on how they would work with self-represented litigants or 
how do they think how are they fighting implicit bias and their um, rulings all kinds of different things you can hear what they say but there are some other resources out there for you to look at uh, that can give guides to folks that have to deal with the courts all the time that can be useful on the state bar of texas website has some information that, uh, that they put out uh, there's a state bar judicial poll where folks that are attorneys and members in good standing of the state bar can vote on which judges they think should win. And that's really fascinating because the attorneys who work in these courts all the time sometimes can have a, a strong opinion or see a different side of the court, right, than just a normal person like you or I may see. Uh, that poll actually closes today, so the results are not up yet, um, but after today, I believe you'll be able to log on there and see what the legal community is saying about the folks that are running for office. Um, uh, you can also look at endorsements, you know, of course, uh, oftentimes newspapers or different groups will endorse sometimes advocacy groups that have strong opinions on one way or the other about criminal justice uh, can offer endorsements and depending on your viewpoint you could look at an advocacy group that agrees kind of with what you think and vote that way and also go to the candidates website that I always find very useful we talked about how to be a judge part of that is actually being a manager being good at technology and a manager of people and so you know folks that take time and and do an effective website that can kind of give you some hints as to what maybe their court website will look like and things like that so um, those are some of the ways we use or we recommend to kind of find out who you can consider voting on for these topics. So we want to remind you um, that starting next week, you want to have your voting plan. When are you going to vote? Where are you going to vote? Who are you voting for? And what should you bring with you? Vote 411 has all of the voters guide information on there for you. And you can bring uh, you know, you can't bring your cell phone when you vote, but you can certainly, I always write down who I'm voting for because there's too many races I will forget when I get in there, especially when we get down to the bottom. So uh, things like that can really be helpful. Um, and just as a reminder, sometimes when we have really long ballots and when you know a good deal of people are voting on something, you feel like oh, maybe it doesn't matter for me to kind of research all the way down to the ballot box. But sometimes these local positions or these positions we tend to not pay as much attention to um, can have the greatest effect on our life. Uh, for example, if you're a renter and you want to know, uh, you know, if you for some reason knew someone who was getting evicted, that that process was fair and impartial and done well, then you need to research who you want to vote for for justice of the peace. You know, if you care about issues like domestic violence or if you have to go through a divorce or all kinds of stuff that comes up sometimes in our worst moments, it's our votes that decide who we're actually going to interact with. And certainly at these high levels, like the Texas Supreme Court, it can actually influence what uh, laws are going to stand in the state of Texas. So there's a very important races. I know they're difficult to choose from. I, even though I work uh, adjacent to the system, sometimes these are still the hardest races for myself to research and figure out. But coming tonight is a really good start. And hopefully uh, we've given you some ideas on how to get more information if you need that. So any other questions before we wrap up? If you have friends that happen to have missed tonight's presentation, uh, you can check out our Facebook page and I'll be uploading the video to our YouTube. If you happen to miss last week's session or the one before that that talks about um, making an informed decision and changes on how uh, changes that might affect you and uh, going out to vote at the voting booth or ballot by mail, those are already on our YouTube channel. All right, we did get a comment. Thank you so much for that feedback. Uh, I'll read a little piece of it here. I'm an engineer and engineers are not known for their voting skills. I would disagree with that. I think engineers are probably very detail oriented, which is exactly what we're looking for when you're going in and thinking about this. So thank you for the good question and the feedback. Um, we can, you know, we'll check the Facebook as well. So if there's any follow-up questions, I can always uh, shoot you an email and I'll put my email here in the chat box as well. Uh, if anybody would like 
thinks of a question later on, um, and maybe the one I can't answer, and we can search it out together. So, Jen, anything else? Uh, nope, that's all I had for this evening. Thank you for joining us and and definitely vote early, vote often. Uh, Jessica and I will be back again because the next election will be in May. <laughs> <laughs> local election, exactly. So Yeah, local election in May, be prepared. And the runoffs. There's a possibility that the people that you're researching now, we may not be able to narrow them down to the point where we've got a one-on-one -on -one, um, matchup in the fall. So we'll have the runoffs will happen probably May as well, May, June. And then we'll have the big fall election coming up. So lots to think about and it's gonna start coming fast and furious, but thanks for starting off tonight with us and we hope to see you soon again. Yeah. Well, have a good evening, everybody. Good luck with your voting and your research. <laughs> Thank you.